Well, our first speaker tonight is Stuart McAllister. Uh, Stuart has spent a lifetime studying Islam and a lifetime engaging in friendship with Muslims. He comes at this from the perspective of someone who's done his homework, who has done his study. He's gonna be approaching this from the question of freedom around the world in different philosophies, in different cultures. Uh, but it's not just an academic thing for Stuart. This is about people he knows, people he loves, uh, people he spent time with. There's a real relationality and care in his heart for particular Muslim friends. Um, and so I'm really glad that we get to hear from him tonight. Uh, Stuart made the mistake of hiring me uh, five and a half years ago, and I am so glad for that error. Um, ever since then, uh, I have enjoyed the warmth of his friendship, uh, the insights that he brings to me as a mentor, the encouragement and affirmation he's brought into my life, and the passion and the joy he demonstrates to me, the adventure of following Christ. Uh, Stuart is someone I unashamedly look up to and who I really ask for you to join me in welcoming him for tonight's talk. Well, good evening. You're going to hear a range of exotic accents. It's one of the things we can guarantee at RZIM. You've got my southern accent from Lower Georgia here. <laughs> and then we'll have uh, Abdu from uh, that, uh, the northern hemisphere of Detroit. And then we've got some Australians and an Englishman. So you really are going to get all the tones. So if I say some phrase, what in the world did he say? You can go and ask my son and he'll translate for you. Well, this subject, I'm going to jump in because time is going to run away with us and you're going to get a deluge of content and I hope that we can get some good thought going. But the subject of freedom has really been on my mind now for a number of years because I hadn't realized the centrality of this in so many different kinds of conversations. You know, all of us long for true liberation. My experience as a young man growing up in Scotland was very much frustrated by my home life and actually trying to run away from home when I was 13 years of age. I actually left home when I was 15, so I succeeded a couple of years later. And it's only recently I realized that what I was looking for was freedom. The problem was I didn't really know what freedom meant. I knew how to get away from something, my parents, my family, structures and all this kind of stuff, but I didn't really understand what it meant to live in true freedom, to be liberated. So as we begin, I want us to look at a conversation in the Bible here that begins in John chapter 8. Many of you are familiar with this text. And here is Jesus, of course, already in the midst of his ministry. He's creating a lot of stir because he's speaking to his fellow Jews and he's, he's discussing things that are definitely stirring the pot. And in this discussion in John chapter 8, he's already in this discussion with the Jewish people. In verse 31, it says, Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, then you're truly disciples of mine. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's offspring, have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you, can, you, you shall become free? Jesus answered and said, truly I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever, the son remains forever. If therefore the son shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you're Abraham's offspring, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you have heard from your father. Now you may want to read this passage a lot more in depth. Things go a bit downhill from there on. Uh, there's a great deal of tension, and you can imagine that, because here are these covenant people, Jewish people, who see themselves not only as the, the children of Abraham, but the, the chosen people. And they have the truth, they have reality, they are God's people. And yet Jesus seems to be questioning that. They're using their heritage. But the point that Jesus wants them to see in which they cannot get at this stage is really mentioned in, in verse 34. When he talks about a slavery to sin, there's a power, there's something else in life that they don't seem to grasp to which they're actually slaves. And that power is the central part of Jesus' ministry. In other words, there's a deeper freedom, a more necessary one, than they actually realize. And this is true of all religious heritages. Many people want religion or see different religious pathways as instruments of attaining freedom, but sometimes that doesn't deal with the deeper inner condition that releases them to be free. So freedom is highly attractive. 
It's, uh, the Bible revolves around two great liberation stories. The first, the exodus of the Jews led by Moses. That's a liberation story, the story of the people set free from Pharaoh's rule, led out towards the promised land, given the law, the covenants, and so forth. But the story of Jesus is a second liberation story. It's also an ultimate story of freedom and results in the final setting, uh, healing of the universe. But let's think, first of all, about the meaning of freedom. What do we mean? Let's look at a few dictionary definitions to get some of the terms here. In the dictionary, it says, the power or right to act, speak, or think as one wants, or absence of subjection to foreign domination or despotic government, or the power of self-determination attributed to the will, the quality of being independent of fate or necessity. That's the kind of definition that I was thinking of when I was a teenager in Scotland. If I could just be free, in this case it was my parents or something like that, or culture, morality, other people's imposed life. I just wanted to be free, free baby, you know, suck them out of existence, live the good life. Until I got out there and found out that I had to pay rent and wash my own clothes <laughs> and cook. Well, you know, that's a different story. But all of these definitions, all of them lack something. They don't say anything about internal freedom. They don't say anything about psychological bondage. They don't talk about some of the spiritual aspects. Well, let's look at modern times for some other examples. He is one of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Jim Morrison. Those of you who are over 20 will remember The Doors. The most important kind of freedom is to be what you really are. You trade in your reality for a role. You trade in your sense for an act. You give up your ability to feel and in exchange put on a mask. There can't be any large-scale revolution until there's a personal revolution on an individual level. It's got to happen inside first. How's that working out for you, Jim? But well, that's another story. But maybe the more classic view of Western freedom that many of us have been raised by is that, of course, from John Stuart Mill. The only freedom which deserves the name is that of pursuing our own good in our own way, so long as we do not attempt to deprive others of theirs or impede their efforts to attain it. This is kind of a mantra now that is basically all through Western culture and through most places where modernity spreads. It becomes the kind of a, the belief system of a culture. Now, by contrast, here's some an Islamic voice, just as a contrast to these different views. As for freedom of belief, it is not absolute so that no one may believe whatever he likes to believe, that one may believe, sorry, whatever he likes to believe. It is enjoined on all sane adults to believe in God as deity and Lord, to accept his right to obedience and submission. Men may not choose to believe otherwise, which within the Islamic narrative makes total sense. If there is a God and he is the, su the supreme power and the all holy and good one, then he has a right to be honored. The author goes on, man was born to search for truth and to come upon the truth, not to follow false ways. And so it is for this reason that we say with confidence, while the freedom of thought should be guaranteed, the indulgence of desire should be restricted. Now many a New Yorker would find that shocking or someone in San Francisco, or maybe down here in Georgia too. As Alistair McIntyre, the philosopher, raised the question, whose freedom, which liberty? We all use this word, but different people mean different things by the idea of freedom. But the desire for freedom is definitely universal. Freedom, says Benjamin Franklin, is not a gift bestowed upon us by other men, but a right that belongs to us by the laws of God and nature. Of course, that assumes a worldview, even as he's saying it, doesn't it? But most Americans set that, see that and they go, yes. Abraham Lincoln, those who deny freedom to others deserve it not for themselves. A lesson that was painfully learned in this country by the Civil War and by the cost of freedom one that we haven't yet fully been liberated from. But let me give you a few questions when we think about this subject of freedom. Is freedom sim simply unlimited self-expression? Is that what freedom is? Are there conditions and considerations which must be answered for true freedom to actually occur in our lives? Is the freedom issue centered in our will and what our rational minds decide and what one ultimately chooses? Is that all it is? Just give me freedom to make my own wise, free choices. So in other words, what I'm beginning with here is to try to let us think a little bit of the struggle to define freedom as we try to work into this space. There is a process involved in thinking this through. 
I like this from Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. Certainly an issue that we feel very much these days in our news, isn't it? As Os Guinness put it, the right to believe something does not mean that everything one believes is right. So this means we have to put on our critical hats. We'd have to do a little bit of thinking. And one of the people that has written widely and wisely on the subject of freedom was the Oxford philosopher Isaiah Berlin. And this helped enormously in my own thinking, trying to understand a little bit about freedom, when he contrasts two different kinds of freedom. You see, as a young man, I knew that I wanted to be free from something. I seemed to want to be free from the problems of what I was, of restricting my freedom, my self-expression, my liberties, my behavior, my choices. And he calls this negative freedom. There is a legitimate sense if we are trapped in some kind of bondage, some kind of struggle, some kind of a political structure, a social structure, or even family structure, or some ideology, we need to be set free from things sometimes in order to truly be free. But that's not enough in itself. Here in America, from the Declaration of Independence was one thing. Americans were set free from those tyrannical, horrible British people (laughs) and finally liberated. But then we had years of chaos because until we got a constitution, we didn't know what we were free for. We needed positive freedom. And you see this in the story of the children of Israel. Even when they came out of Egypt, they were set free, but they didn't know what they were free for. So they were being schooled and formed in the wilderness on the law of God and covenant and worship to become the people of God so that they could live their freedom in the proper sense. You see, we've got to have both ends of this spectrum. There has to be negative freedom and positive freedom for true freedom to occur in our life. That means we need the resources and the liberty to to attain that. But what are the conditions of freedom? During the Second World War, many parts of the world lay under the dominion of two great evil uh, empires, one from the Nazis, one from the Japanese. They ruled over. And under those respective governments in Europe, Jews, Slavs, and Gypsies uh, struggled for freedom. In fact, their lives were constantly being forfeit. In China, or, and the Chinese, the Koreans, and many other of the Asians suffered under the rule of the Japanese. So when these people were living under those ideologies, their lives were constrained. Yes, they went shopping, they still had babies and, and so forth. Generally in life, they would gone with a, a sort of a normal day of life, but under these rules, under draconian rules, and they longed for freedom. How would they be set free? Well, the only way they could be free was for the enemy to, de- to be defeated. The military power had to be conquered and destroyed. The territory had to be captured. The captives had to be liberated and the power had to be broken. So freedom didn't come unless a higher power, a greater power was used to break break these people free. A greater power was essential. So true liberation came then only by a result of greater force and with great cost. And I think what many Malays, many Filipinos, many people understood, they needed outside help to be free. And I think this is something we want to grasp in distinction and understanding in the question of freedom. We may want freedom, but most of us not understanding what is really wrong in our life. We don't know that we need help to be free. So when we think about freedom, let's think about freedom and some of the external factors, because there's a lot of confusion about the meaning meaning and the limits of freedom. And you see this clashing, you see it on the news, you see it on social media, you see us arguing and fighting with one another about people's freedom. We want to give everybody freedom, but once they take their freedom, we fight with each other over whose freedom are we, how do we limit it? Can we all do that which is right in our own eyes? Does it not lead to a form of social chaos in a sense? But here's some of the, the, this is the teenager's dream. This is a quote from my colleague uh, about contemporary visions. And this is Os Guinness. He says, some people dream of freedom as the dream of ever expanding emancipation, ever multiplying liberation movements, ever deepening fulfillment is being pushed from behind by the memory of a thousand oppressions and pulled ahead by the promise of unrestrained choice and unhindered creativity leading to unlimited possibilities. Infinite in all directions, as the futurist cheerleaders say. This is the Star Trek universe, going into infinite combinations and infinite world. So we want freedom. 
Historically, when you think the, of the idea of freed, the French and the French Revolution told us that men must be forced to be free. Some of us can't be free unless we are forced to live under the general will. Each of us puts his person under the supreme direction of the general will, said Jean-Jacques Rousseau. That means that the body politic or the sovereign consisting of, of every system, citizen, insofar as entering into this body creates a single individual, the interests of particular individuals are outweighed by the common interest. So maybe I am acting as an individual, but I can only find my true individuality within the state, within the nation, within my part of that body. And maybe I need help to be liberated so that my individuality, my free expression, which to Americans is anathema, is seen in light of the whole. Now, you wouldn't like that. Many Americans wouldn't like that. But this is an ideology that some people do like. We become a communist or we become of a state where we, we want to force you to be free, not in your terms, but in our terms, where the, the, the sum of the whole overwhelms the individual parts. How attractive is that to you? Well, listen to another set of voice again. Islamic voice is here. Whoever submits to other than God surrenders as much of his freedom as he submits and humbles himself to other than his Lord. The whole idea that if there's a God in the universe, if Allah is that God, then anything else that they would take that is a form of idolatry. It's worshipping something else. So you can imagine the clash in Western culture, particularly with many sincere devoted Muslims. They look at a lot of what we call as freedom and they see it as an abomination. They look at our sexual attitudes. They look at many of the things that we do in our lifestyles and they find this hor horrifying. And that's not because these people are all bad or evil. It's because they are sincerely devoted and committed to a worldview that wants them to raise their families in a moral structure and a frame of reference and have a just society. Now, I still believe there are, there are many problems in this and we're going to talk about that as the days go on. But you can see at least the seeds of some of the conflict. Here's some of the examples given of some of these other voices. Some of these are false lords. Some of these false lords went so far as to distant God's scriptures revealed from, to his messengers in order to legitimize their whims. They corrupted those scriptures by adding foreign material to them. Some of them went so far as to guarantee reward in the hereafter to some people and punishment to others and to sell indulgences, promising paradise, paradise to some individuals. I'm sure you recognize shades of looking through Christendom history and the Catholic Church selling, selling indulgences and so forth. But then the, the writer goes on to more modern times. He says, modern forms of accepting false lords are embodied in the materialistic philosophies of history and in the enslavement to carnal desires and pleasure. And therefore, the essence of a call to belief in one God is a call to freedom and the lifting of oppressors subjugation of human beings. So many sincere and devoted Muslims, including the radicals, they see themselves, whether through the Dawah or through various movements, as breaking the hold of idolatry to try that people could be free. And when they look at America or the West, they see our lifestyle, they see our cultures, and they see so much decadence, they feel it's an, an act of justice and missionary zeal in order to set these countries free. Now let's hold that for a minute. It seems that there's a kind of a common ground with all of these things. Some of these very liberal voices of freedom, Christianity and Islam, at least there's some commonalities I want us to think about. Each of them believes that we are bound in some way and need liberation. Now, we may differ intensely on what it is that binds us. Each of them believes that something is wrong and hinders freedom. And again, we differ. Each offers a way or a solution towards the desired goal. But can I just point out here, these things are not the same. You know the person that loves to say, well, all religions are essentially the same, you know, they're, 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 they're just superficially the same only, you know, or fundamentally the same, superficially different, when in fact, it's the exact opposite. They're superficially the same, but they're fundamentally different. These things are not the same. We are talking about some of the same questions. So let me zero in a little bit on freedom and internal factors. If in the Second World War and if in these type of things we need to break external things to try and bring liberty, what about internal problems? You see, after the war was over, many of those people who were set free were brutalized. They had experienced terrible horrors 
Whether you read the story of Corrie ten Boom and you, you find the death of her sister Be Betsy in Ravensbrück concentration camp, and, and Corrie actually met one of the, the, the guards in that camp and forgave him. It wasn't an easy journey, but because of her Christianity, she was able to forgive him. But you contrast this with the book, The Sunflower by Simon Wiesenthal, who has a dying SS soldier and he is brought in to a, a, a hospital where the, the, Jew, the, the SS uh, soldier wants him to forgive him. He wants absolution in this and, and Wiesenthal doesn't do it. And this is a very famous book that goes back, what should he have done? What was the right thing to do here? You see, if we are free, physically or free externally, but we are slaves to lust or slaves to hatred or slaves to anger or slaves to some other fierce power that dominates us, how are we free? There's this internal bondage. And let me give you a few examples. First of all, the problem of addiction. And some of you in this room, some of you watching on the live stream, some of you know what this is like. Or some of you have partners or children with this. We can't trivialize this. Gene Kilborn says, addiction begins with the hope that something out there can instantly fill up the emptiness inside. It's a serious issue. Cornelius Plantinga says, at every stage, addiction is driven by one of the most powerful, mysterious, and vital forces of human existence. What drives addiction is longing. A longing not just of brain, belly, or loins, but finally, of the heart. I love this quote by Damon Alborn. He says, in the 1960s, people took acid to make the world weird. Now the world is weird, and people take Prozac to make it normal. <laughs> <laughs> We're really a mess. The addict needs more than advice, more than a program. They need help to break this power that has overcome them. And what of depression? Consider these voices, and this is a cruel, cruel thing. Please understand, I'm not minimizing this. If you suffer from depression, and you need medication or help or counseling or just love and all of the above, never undermine the sadness and the sorrow of lives that labor under depression and the agony that this can be in homes and families. Listen to Mary Roach. I don't fear death so much as I fear its prologues, loneliness, decrepitude, pain, debilitation, depression, senility. After a few years of those, I imagine death presents like a holiday at the beach. Rollo May said, depression is the inability to construct a future. When the lights have gone out, there's no hope. There's nothing else to live for. We've just died on the inside. Dorothy Hamill, at times I feel overwhelmed and my depression leads me into darkness. Do you ever wonder with all of the toys, with all of the things that we've got at our fingertips, we've got so many things. Why is it that so many of us are so unfree? More money, more freedom, can do what we want, go where we want, and yet there's this deep sense of being captives of something that binds us. Now, another thing that you may not have considered is that you can also have a problem with morality and your conscience. Sometimes people who are hyper-moral, and this includes many a churchgoer, maybe many a Muslim, many a person raised in a Hindu background, are sometimes slaves to trying to keep up with all of the religious demands. They want to do what is right, they try to do what is right, and they go everywhere, they go to all the meetings, they pray, they fast, they give, they do whatever, and it's never enough. And they go to bed at night, and the words hanging over their bed, guilty, 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 or shame. You should be embarrassed. What kind of a Christian are you? What kind of a Muslim are you? What kind of a Hindu? You're a failure. You had those lustful thoughts. You blew it once again. And sometimes religion aggravates the problem because we don't know our own inabilities. In Romans chapter 7, there's a, here's a test of me of as uh, Paul was discovering at one point the power of the law and yet something greater than his will was, was holding him. In Romans chapter 7, 14 through 20, he says, speaking of the law of God, we know the law is spiritual, but I, sorry, I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. That which I am doing, I do not understand. For I'm not practicing what I would like to do. I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not wish to do, I agree with the law, confessing that it's good. 
So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I wish I do not do, but I practice the evil that I do not, that I do not wish. But if I am doing the very thing I do not wish, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which indwells me. Paul comes across something, a serious weakness. There's an inability, there's an impetus, impotence, there's, there's, a, there's a powerlessness, even though there's a sincere longing, a genuine, honest desire for the truth. He doesn't lack desire. He doesn't lack knowledge. He doesn't lack a vision. He lacks ability. So what I want to suggest to you is that in this conversation these days, we're seeking a fuller kind of freedom. I like these words from Brennan Manning, and many of you know who Brennan's story himself as a, a Catholic writer, but also struggled deeply with alcoholism as well. But listen to these words. Real freedom is freedom from the opinions of others. Above all, freedom from your opinions about yourself. Wouldn't that be great for some of us? <laughs> Not having to think night and day about your, how you are. The dictionary of, the philosophy, of the dictionary of Philosophy on Freedom said, freedom from past thoughts and future expectations is true freedom. Freedom to be, to exist, to experience joy. God, innocence, consciousness is true freedom and is entirely, internally of the present moment. Freedom comes from being aware of what truly makes you happy and taking responsibility for this. But if we are going to be free, truly free, on the inside and the outside then we need to find a kind of freedom that deals with the mind, with the heart, and with the will. Now, we haven't got time to go into this, and I'm probably going to uh, rouse a few ires on this tonight, but I'm going to cite a little bit of the back and forth between Martin Luther and Erasmus of Rotterdam. Because at the heart of this was the part of how much freedom did we have? Well, Luther didn't believe we had very much at all, for good reason. Erasmus felt, well, God had given us commands and he was commanding us to do them. And if you can do them, you must be able to do them or else why would God command them? But here's uh, in the, uh, the bondage of the will, here is some of Luther's response to Erasmus. And I want you to hear this. He said, the commandments are not given inappropriately or pointlessly, but in order that through them, the proud blind man may learn the plague of his impotence. A little bit like just happened in Romans chapter 7. Should he try to do as he is commanded? By the law, it says in Romans 3.20, is the knowledge of sin. So the word of grace comes only to those who are distressed by a sense of sin and tempted to despair. Now clearly this was Luther's own experience. And yet he had begun to see the liberating power that he knew he could not save himself. He couldn't pull himself up by his bootstraps. He couldn't do what was demanded. So he says, let all free will in the world do all it can with all of its strength. It will never give rise to a single instance of ability to avoid being hardened. If God does not give the spirit or if meriting mercy, if it is left to its own strength. He deeply believed in the power of grace in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I had time tonight, I would talk about the, the story as a witness to this, Louis Zamperini. If you've never seen the film Unbroken, don't see the film, get the book. Absolutely brilliant writing. Because you read this book about this hellion New Jersey boy, not Vince Vitale, one of his, his descendants. <laughs> and... Uh, this guy really was a wild kid. And, you know, he was out there and his brother got him into running and then he ends up running in the 1936 Olympics and all this. He could run like the wind. And then he ends up going, the war broke out. He goes into the war. He gets shot down. He lands in the Pacific Ocean. He's attacked by sharks. He gets captured by the Japanese. He is tortured. I mean, it is a story of agony. Comes back from the war and he's got all these demons and all this darkness and he can't get his life together and he's, going, he's damaging his marriage and he goes to a Billy Graham rally. He hears the gospel and he gets saved. And God changes this guy. And he spent his life, in fact, so much so that Anjali uh, Jolie uh, really fell in love with this guy. And that's why the film got made, partly, because she heard of his story. You see, we need a freedom that, uh, is, that has to reconcile the outer problems of our life, but the inner freedom, the external demands of a holy God, a broken law, moral failure must be addressed. But the inner needs of love, Freedom from lusts, addictions, guilt, shame, sin. We need a freedom that delivers us from evil and a freedom that enables us to be good, to want the good, 
and to do good. So that's why I want to suggest to you the gospel is a way of freedom. We have just come through the Christmas season here and there's one book in particular I always like to turn to when I think of the incarnation in Christ. If you turn, uh, or if you have your Bibles, but Titus chapter three, it's up here, you can read it. And listen to these words. I just get, let these words, for all those who know they are helpless and hopeless, the gospel offers good news. Titus chapter three in verses three through eight. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. This was me. This was my story. I was a, worked in a bouncer and dance hall. I loved to fight. I liked to hurt people. I didn't want God. I wasn't looking. I wasn't walking down road, life's narrow road and I felt you know, miserable or anything like that. I was having a party, for goodness sake. <laughs> and I got ambushed by God. And this is what happened. But when the kindness of our God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently, Paul says to Titus, so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds, these things are good and profitable for men. You see, the grace of God appeared. The initiative for, is from God. Titus speaks of his goodness, his loving kindness. And this is the great words of Jesus in John 3, or we read in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. According to his mercy, according to his grace. And grace leads us in freedom and to freedom. I like these words from Max Lucado. He said, the meaning of life, the wasted years of life, the poor choices of life, God answers the mess of life with one word, grace. Grace is a word we can't get our head around. Unmerited favor. And to be truly free, you can only live if you know you're in grace. The grace is forgiven, the grace is healed, and the grace is working in your life. Anne Lamott put it beautifully. I do not at all understand the mystery of grace, only that it meets us where we are, but it does not leave us where it found us. The grace comes to the, the most broken, the most angry, the most upset, the most self-righteous person. Grace meets you there and doesn't leave you as you are. And that's why the name Jesus is Jehovah saves. So when Christians talk about the gospel, it's a very profound thing that we're talking about. Because it has to do with a power. The word power in the uh, English dictionary means the ability to act, capability of doing or accomplishing something. I'm standing here as a Christian and I don't, would never ever profess that I have it all together, that everything is right. I've got problems. I'm in 62 years of age now, and I've got struggles in life, and there are pains and sorrows still in my heart. But I am free. And one day I will be fully free. I can look back and say that all that I did was forgiven because of the cross. I can look around today and say, honestly, who I am has been dealt with by the grace of Christ today in my life. But I can look forward and say, one day I will be home with my Savior, and all of the pains and sorrows will disappear. And this old body that's a bit crampy and weak and getting bulldozed over now by age and sorrow, I'll get a new one that lasts forever. But it takes a power to do that. And there is a power. And so when Paul was writing to the Romans with his background in Judaism, with his zeal for, for, with, for, his zeal for Judaism and his failure, then the encounter on the Damascus Road, the one-time Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul the Apostle. He knows the grace and power of God. And at the very opening in this book of Romans, he says this to the Romans in Romans 1, 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. That was the basis 
of his freedom. That was the basis of Roman freedom. That is the basis in which freedom spread from the Christian message around the world. And that's the basis that we are offering today, that if you truly want to be free, then Christ will set you free. And as we look at Islam, we don't want to be critical, bitter, or angry towards anything, but we do want to compare these freedom stories and ask whether or not Christ makes better sense of the freedom question than the alternatives. And I hope you'll give us a shot at doing that in these coming sessions. God bless you. Thank you.